I've studied all available charts of their plants, planets, and stars, and more, and, and, and none of them match their others. There are just as many measurements as, and methods as there are astronomers, and all of, the, all of them disagree. What's needed is a long-term project with the, with the aim of mapping the heavens conducted from a single location over a period of several years. Tycho Brahe, 1563, at age 17. Really? <laughs> he was a scholar of Polish, Polish birds. He was a scholar of Polish birds who stopped the sun and moved, moved the earth. Polish adage regard, regarding Copernicus. The specific theory I like best is that the, the rings of the Saturn are composed uh, entirely of lost airline luggage. <laughs> Mark Russell, political satirist. Hmm. Let me leave light counter for a moment moment and talk about another phenomenon which was in gross con contradiction to classical ideas of the, the, the same area. The late 1800s, people were discovering uh, radiation and radioactivity. In the late 1800s, this was really exciting stuff. It was just so cool to find a little rock that glows or that could expose film. It was almost like a magic, but of course it's a physics and the people were trying to understand it. It just didn't fit in, the, in with the classical wo worldview. Energy was uh, just coming out of no nowhere. It, uh, it, it was a crazy phenomenon, so it got a lot of attention. People were studying radiation and radioactivity like crazy. The development of our understanding was very rapid. From the 1890s, when people first began to observe, measure and understand the radiation to say, Early 1900, people began to categorize the radiation. Aha! Uh -huh. Now you have to name this stuff. Everybody always, everybody always wants to give a name when you discover something new, and the Greek alphabet was used. Alpha, beta, and gamma are the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. So radiation was called alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. Yes. Nowadays, we've used up all the whole Greek alphabet. We'll be talking about that in the future lectures, right? People were trying to understand what this radiation was. One of the most important early experiments was done in 1897 by a British physicist named J.J. Thompson. Yes. He, he had this device, which we are still use today. It's, it's basically an evacuated glass sphere or chamber. He sucked all the air out of it and at attached a big high voltage battery one terminal on one side and the other terminal on the other side. The then some little rays appeared. Radiations. It's called beta radiation. Sometimes it was called cathode rays because the, 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 the chemist used to call one of the poles, the negative pole of the battery, the cathode. The rays seeming, seeming, the rays seems to go from the negative side to the positive side, and in the 1897, J.J. Thompson did a series of the experiments that are really pinned down what this beta radiation was. Cathode ray, by the way, is still the same we use if we are looking at your TV set or a computer monitor that's called a CRT, a cathode ray tube. So there is, uh, th these things are still in use. Hmm. It's really um, the cathode rays or beta rays uh, coming from one side to the other and hitting a screen, making it glow. Huh. Mr. Thompson did a series of experiments. For example, he put an electric field around his device and watched the beam bend. So that so that that demonstrated that it was electrically charged. Yes. Then he used a magnetic field and watched the beam bend so he could figure out properties of the beam. He could figure out which way it was going. He, he deduced that the, the, the ray were negative particles, they were negatively charged objects. 
that negative referring to the electrical charge of the object, and that that, that they were very, very light in that they were 2,000 times lighter than the lightest things known at the time, which was a hydrogen atom. Wow. Remember, atoms are supposed to be uh, indivisible and the lightest, smallest atom of all, hydrogen, has one unit of mass, some system of measuring weights. Now we found something li li lighter still by a big factor, so this is a huge puzzle. Legend Thompson did lots of measurements and discovered that no matter what you what you made the, the, the tube out of, no matter what your uh, residual gas was, they were always the same particles, particle, the same electric charge. These little negative electrons that were very slight. So there seems to be in everything. No matter what you make the device out of, there is an electron in there. Wow. There were other experiments being done at the time. For example, Mr. Lontgen, a German physicist, was looking at what happened when these beta rays hit the other end of the device they stopped. Then there is something, some, some, some other mysterious ray which has been uh, called variously gamma rays or X rays. They were tru truly in invisible as they would travel through the room, but you could detect them with a photogenic plates. Photo sorry, photographic plates. For example, if you put your hands in the path of the X-rays, you'll see a shadow image of your hands. Your bones will absorb the X-radiation and the skin will not. So you see what's now used in the medicine at your dentist, just an X-ray. At that time, we are calling them the gamma rays. All of this stuff was beginning to come into some sort of the order, but people really didn't have a deep understanding of where this stuff was coming from. That what what its origin were, right? One of the big players in, in, in this story was Ernest Rutherford. He was born in the New Zealand, spent his life in England, formed what is now known as the Rutherford Laboratories. He did a whole series of measurements over the long course of his career. He was truly amazing experimentalist, right? He really was, in some sense, the, the one who figured out what the radiation was. Though, J.J. Thompson figured out what the beta radiation was, Ernest Rutherford figured out, for example, what alpha radiation was, little particles, but heavier, in fact, four times heavier than the hydrogen. They were very, very heavy compared to the beta rays, and they were positively charged rather than negatively charged. Hmm. Mr. Rutherford figured out lots of things. He figured out that if alpha radiation was to hit a, a target, like nitrogen, it could char it, it, it could change the, the, the from nitrogen into oxygen. This is a radical idea in the early 1900s, right? That one element, that one element, nitrogen, could be converted into another element, oxygen. There is something going on here that is teaching us that uh, atoms are not indivisible after all, right? They are made up of the smaller pieces and they are not Im immutable. You could change one to the other, but still, there was uh, no deep understanding of what the atoms really was. So Rutherford, a brilliant experimentalist, said, Look, we have to figure out what an atom is. So here is this here is his idea to take a source of the alpha radiation, just a natural chunk of material like some uranium and cover it up with a lead with with a lead, so the lead will absorb that alpha radiation. So nothing coming out, it's just a little bit warm, so we are going to drill a little hole in one side and we have a little beam of the alpha particles that can come out of these things. Haha. <laughs> so this is an essential ingredient for all phys physics experiments, particle phys physics experiments. Even today, you need a source and beam of particles. Now, what are you... What are we going to do with that beam? Instead of studying the beam, we are going to use the beam as a probe to study as a probe to study atoms. 
so we need to summon atoms. He took a foil, like silver foil, except he used gold foil, and the, and the reason he used gold is is that uh, it's a lovely material to work with. We, we, you, you can make it very, very thin. You've got a little thin layer, little thin layer of gold atoms, and we are going to shine uh, these alpha particles at the gold and and ask, what do they do? Wow, that's the reason why gold is used for. Wow. Now, in general, when you do an experiment like this, you have uh, some idea in advance of the what you think is going to happen. So, what do you think is going to happen? J.J. Thompson, remember, the guy who discovered the electron in 1897, he has an idea that uh, he has published. He called it as a plum padding model. I love that, uh, the plum padding model of the atom. <laughs> So what do you, what do we know in the in the late 1800s early 1900s about atoms? We know roughly how big they are. They are about 10 to minus 10 power meters in size. All of them are about the same, um, the same size, right? Okay. We know that uh, they contain electrons inside of them, tiny light object. To, which are negatively charged, but we know that atoms themselves are electrically neutral, so there must be some positive charge in there. Wow! Mr. Thompson, plum pudding model, held that the positive charge is smear. It's a s spread out over the entire side. That's why the atom is as big as it is, because the positive charge is go that spread out over 10 to minus 10 power meters, and that's the plum pudding model. The plum are the little electrons in there, the little hard nuggets that are very light, and you can knock them out in various experiments. So Mr. Rutherford takes his beam of the alpha particles, which he is em em envisioning as a little sub-microscopic particles that are very massive, and he runs it into the, the foil. Now, what would you expect if you look, if you took a little b BB and you run it into the sun plum padding? Well, what you'd expect is that you'd smooth uh, you'd swoosh through the plum pudding and go pretty much in the straight line, maybe de de deviate a little bit off to the, to the side. Then he sent his graduate student down into the basement where he had set up the source and the target. They needed a, de they needed a, a detector. He used some f uh, phosphorescent material that when an alpha particle hit it, it flashes a little bit. So. These poor students were down in the dark watching the individual flashes, counting them, trying to see how many particles come through at the various angles to verify this theory of J.J. Thompson's. One of those students was Geiger, and Geiger became, the, became famous for developing the Geiger counter because he got so sick of sitting there counting with his eyeballs <laughs> in layers. In, in, in later years, he developed this electric device to do the counting. Ha ha ha! Need is the, the source of invention, right? If there is a need, there must be a, a, a new invention after it in order to solve this problem issue. Mr. Rutherford was a smart guy. He was a good physicist, probably one of the greatest experimental physicists in history. One of the things that uh, occurred to him was uh, th maybe this model was long. So he said, you guys go down there and look at the alpha particles at all angles. Go out 30 degrees, 40 degrees, in fact, go back beyond, uh, go back behind your gold foil target and just see if anything bounces backwards. Ah uh ha -huh. Ah uh ha -huh, ha, okay. Now that's totally nuts, right? If this stuff is plum pudding, everything is pretty much going to go straight through. But, but, they looked and they found their new events bouncing backwards. This is a uh, kind of crazy. I have a quote from Ernest Rutherford. It was quite the most incredible event that ever happened to me in my life. It was as if you fired a 15-inch 
art really shell at the piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. Right, 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 right. Hey, it's a radical. <laughs> this is a man who has essentially discovered a radioactive transmutation. Hmm. He transmutation? He's done lots of pl pl pretty wild stuff in his career and to him, to him he, this was the wildest event that he, he had ever seen. So how can we understand it? Rutherford says, I think even though JJ Thompson is, you know, the old senior physicist, brilliant, he discovered the electron, but I think he's wrong. I don't think we are looking at the plum pudding here. Ha 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 ha. So what could we be looking at? What's the model of an atom? Rutherford says. I have a different idea. Suppose that the positive charge, which we know has to be in there, is very concentrated. Hmm. 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 It is a little dot right in the middle, massive. That's where the mass, mass of the atom lives. And the electrons are these little super light things that are that are, are sort are, are orbiting around like the planets around the, the central sun, which is uh, the, the nucleus. So you've got uh, negative charges in orbit and there are heavy, massive, point-like nucleus in the middle. And that's the new planetary model of the atom. This is what this was a uh, Mr. Rutherford's great idea. Wow wow wow. Almost immediately, people said, sorry Mr. Rutherford, but this just can't be right, because we know classical physics. Classical physics says that if an electron does a charged particle is going around in a circle, orbiting around, anytime you have a charged particle going in a circle, it's accelerating around the curve, it's radiating electromagnetic waves, and if you radiate away energy, your orbit's going to decay, like an old satellite hitting the Earth's atmosphere and s s spiraling in, ultimately crashing into the Earth. So, if atoms were the way Mr. Rutherford had suggested, then do the calculation and you discover they w they the they would disappear. <laughs> they would disappear in a puff of uh, greasy black smoke within uh, about a microsecond and uh, there wouldn't be any atoms left, so this model was no good. Hehehehehe. <laughs> People didn't know what to do. It was a good model in some respect, but it had uh, this contradiction with classical physics. Haha, <laughs> if you look, if you encounter the contradiction, there must be some missing piece that you have to create. The emerging the missing piece that is not found yet. So this is uh, the time they discovered, they predicted existence of the strong force. Ha 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 ha. So cool. Along, com along comes a young theoretical student. His name was Niels Bohr. He came from uh, Copenhagen. He was a Danish physicist. The tradition then was uh, the same as it is now. After you get uh, your PhD, you do what is called postdoc. Postdoctoral research. You go for a couple of years, go, uh, years to big name laboratory with some great physicist. You work with them. You learn the ropes. Then, if you do well, you can go off and become a professor on your own. Ha 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 ha. So that's what Niels Bohr was doing at the Rutherford Labs. Aha! Uh -huh, he was at the, uh, the Rutherford Labs, and Niels Bohr said. He's a theorist, so he's trying to interpret the, this result. Look, we know that classical physics seems to be breaking down in the work of Max Planck and uh, the work of Albert Stein when we had the interaction of the radi radiation with atoms. Well, here's another case where we've got atoms and maybe classical physics is breaking down. Whoa. Maybe the interaction of the electrons with, electromagnetic, ra with electromagnetic radiation isn't the classical idea that we've been thinking for some long. So, Niels Bohr has a new model. 
It's the first quantum model. He's taken the idea of the chunk of radiation from the Max Planck and from Albert Einstein. And now he's applying it to the world of atoms, trying to understand their structure. So he says maybe the electrons' orbits are also quantitized. It's not just radiation. Maybe the planetary orbits that are allowed it also come in chunks and that they, and that idea helps to explain why the atom is stable because you can't just go from one orbit to one slightly smaller. In fact, it explains uh, lots more data that was known at the time about the light that is emitted from, say, hydrogen atom when you heat, it, heat them up. Hydrogen atoms glow and the color of glow can now be understood from Mr. Bohr's quantum model. This is a new idea and once again it is uh, flying in the face of the classical theories. And once again, we have invoked the idea of chunks, quanta of energy, chunk of the matter. It's a strange idea, and it's not really a very deep or rigorous theory yet. Niels Bohr's, Niels Bohr's model is just kind of the description of what we are seeing. Like Kepler, we are describing the atoms, but we don't really understand them yet. Yes, yes, yes. People started thinking about these ideas, though. Now we've gathered lots of evidence ranging from Planck's, uh, Pl Planck, Planck, Einstein, Bohr, and all of the all of these this radiation phenomenon. But something different is going on. Yes, nature is different when you get down to the scale of individual atoms. Yes, yes, yes. It's not uh, behaving classically like it does when you are uh, throwing tennis balls, cars, bicycles, and just ordinary world stuff. Something new is going on. So cool. A French prince, a French prince named Louis de Broglier, Broglier, Broglier was working on his physics PhD. He took this idea so seriously. He said, "Look." What we see to be observing is a strange duality. Things are, are particles and they are also waves. Yes, duality. We can't really picture this. When I look at the water wave, it's a wave. It's not a bunch of particles. It's really a wave phenomenon. So yes, yes, yes. Sound, uh, sound, sound, any wave phenomena that you can think of is not a bunch of the little BBs flying about. So it seems that the waves and the particles uh, are two contradictory, pos two contradictory possibilities in the world. You've got, uh, you've got to be either one or the other. Uh -huh. Yet, people, especially Louis de Broglie, are proposing now a wave particle duality. Yes, thousand, thousand of times I've been, I've been studying this, this concept. That's a buzzword. It says uh, you can't quite picture it. It's not a classical idea that you can have a mental model of the directory in your brain. But maybe at the quantum level, at the level of tiny things, you, you can some, somehow be both and neither at the same time. I wish I could make them more concrete for you. I cannot draw you a picture of something that's a wave and particle at the same time. You just kind of have to accept this as a crazy but the true, experimented, experimentally true statement about how little teeny objects are. are. De Broglier said, If it is true for light and the quantum of the light, which we now call photons, if light comes in the chunks, which are called photons, Maybe sometimes something else which comes in the chunks, like electrons, the little particles that are, are running around in the at atom, maybe those things are also waves. After all, if a wave can be a particle, maybe a particle can be a wave. <laughs> Once you accept this idea, you kind of have to run with it. It's your obligation to do a what if. Yes. So, what if electrons are waves? Well, if electron have a wave nature, think of a wave on a guitar string. If you plunk a guitar string, there are certain frequencies that it can be can jiggle at all. At. It can jiggle in the fundamental, or it can jiggle at a twice the fundamental. <laughs> 
there were there are various modes. There are various modes that our guitar string can vibrate in. But not all possibilities are open to you. You can't just change the frequency of the guitar string a little bit without retuning it, without changing the tension. Right. So, De Broglie applied this idea to electrons in an atom and discovered that Mr. Bohr's model was explained. Wow! The quantum nature of electron orbits is explained if you believe that the electrons are waves. Wow! So we are heading toward our theory. Is this still not a fundamental theory? There is not a rigorous mathematical framework yet. Yet. In, in the next lecture, we are going to see the transition, transition that was made in the 1920s from this uh, primitive idea of counter to a more rigorous mathematical framework which we now call quantum mechanics. Yes! Thank you!